Hello, good afternoon, everyone. So it's uh, five minutes after three. Uh, I would like to, in behalf of the Philippine College of Physicians, I'd like to probably start this uh, webinar. But before we start the webinar, may I introduce first um, uh, the president of the Philippine College of Physicians to give the welcome and opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Mario Panaligan. Mario? Yes, uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon. And indeed, it's really very important uh, that we listen, of course, to the experts, particularly in relation to smoking and this time of COVID, no pandemic. Definitely, we know that uh, those individuals with comorbid illnesses, as well as those who are in the senior age group, are more prone to develop severe disease. But certainly, we also need to remember that uh, an important predisposing factor to chronic uh, obstructive lung diseases or other diseases related to uh, smoking can also be related to COVID-19. And therefore, it's very important for all of us to become more familiar on how to handle these individuals. And of course, it's very important for all of us to discourage or even stop or to even advise uh, stop stopping the smoking. And it's quite important really to uh, make sure that, uh, of course, COVID-19 is uh, uh, preventable, but uh, addressing risk factors that can compound you know, this problem should also be stopped or controlled. You know. Now, thank you very much, Dr. Olimpin, for initiating this particular webinar conference. And of course, we'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Uh, Amy Mateo, and of course, Dr. Susi Pineda Mercado. Thank you, and uh, thank you to all participating uh, or to, to all those who are participating in this webcast conference. Over. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Panaligan. So for today, we will be discussing about COVID-19 and lung health. No smoking as the new normal. This is uh, Dr. Maricar Limpin, 
the uh, host uh, and uh, moderator, the moderator for this afternoon's webinar. And uh, today we are really um, very uh, fortunate and lucky to have with us two uh, experts, recognized experts in the field of tobacco control. So first, uh, to give us the evidence, the scientific evidence with regards to smoking and uh, COVID-19 uh, is another public health uh, expert and as well as a hospital and clinical management expert in the person of Dr. Imelda Mateo. Uh, Dr. Mateo is currently the medical center chief of Amang Rodriguez Medical Medi uh, Memorial Medical Center and is the Vice President of Action on Smoking and Health Philippines, the Corporate Secretary of the Philippine College of Chest Physicians, and the uh, Board of Regent of the Philippine College of Physicians. She has uh, held numerous positions, no, both in government and in the civil society organizations. So foremost of this uh, is being the head and chair, uh, chairing and being a part of uh, many task force of the Department of Health. So indeed, um, Dr. Mateo, uh, it is uh, nice to have you with us, being part of both the PCP and also uh, of, of action on smoking and health Philippines. Uh, second, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Susan Pineda Mercado. Um, she is uh, she is also known as a public health expert and is currently a strategic advisor for COVID-19 of uh, of the International uh, Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies Asia Pacific Region. She is also a consultant for COVID-19 for ABS-CBN, a special envoy of the president on global health initiatives in the Philippines, and a board member, public health expert of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. She had worked with WHO for 15 years as the WHO director for NCD and health through the life course in the Western Pacific uh, region. She is internationally recognized for her work on tobacco control and was the regional coordinator for Tobacco Free Initiative for the WHO Western Pacific Region with 37 countries and areas from 2008 to 2012. So also um, Dr. Pineda previously served as the Undersecretary of Health of the Department of Health uh, in the country and was rec uh, awarded as distinguished alumni in the Global Health by University of the Philippines in 2017. So without further ado, uh, so we will now give to you this uh, webinar whole, uh, sponsored by both the Philippine College of, uh, by the Philippine College of Physicians, the Department of Health and Action on Smoking and Health Philippines. So go ahead, I give now the floor to our first speaker, Dr. Amy Mateo. So thank you very much, Dr. Limpin and Dr. Panaligan. And I welcome all of our participants here. It is indeed an opportunity to speak and discuss considering all about uh, tobacco control, considering this is the World No Tobacco Month. So I would like to share my slides, my presentation. Uh, can everybody see the presentation now? Am I visible to everyone? Yeah, uh, yes, it's, right. it's visible now. Yeah. All right, so our topic is in the no smoking in the new normal. So what shall we do, right? Uh, we have to observe still personal or social distancing, but in the new normal, we still have to observe and practice no smoking. And this should be strengthened with different physical activities or be replaced with worthwhile physical activities while at the same time staying safe. Okay? So. All right, so the objective of our presentation as what I have gathered from our uh, moderator is to inform the public 
and update us on the dangers of using tobacco. Of course, we would want to discourage initiation and those who are currently smokers to be encouraged to avail of the cessation services. And in the long run, we want to promote a healthy, no smoking lifestyle. Okay, this is a slide which shows that indeed smoking is an illness. And we want everyone to remember similar to the ICD coding of COVID-19, smoking is also an illness which has its own ICD-10 classification. So please remember this so that when you see your patient and who are smokers and you have established dependence, include this in your final diagnosis. Why is this important? Because it is also covered by PhilHealth. Okay? So in May 11 of this year, the WHO issued some statements regarding tobacco use and its relationship with COVID. So knowing that tobacco kills more than 8 million people globally a year, and there are more than 7 million of deaths which, which are associated with direct tobacco use, 1.2 million of these deaths are those secondhand smokers exposed to direct smoke from a, a firsthand smoke or smoker. And tobacco smoking is a proven risk factor for many respiratory infections and increase in the severity of respiratory diseases. So in this time of pandemic of the COVID-19, we know that tobacco smoking poses a um, risk factor for the severity or even mortality of the patients. All right, so converting it to uh, time, one person dies every 4.5 seconds from a tobacco-related disease. Okay. And let's remember that tobacco dependence is a three-link chain, which has its biological dependence, its psychological dependence, and sociocultural factor. Biological dependence is the direct effect of nicotine and other harmful chemicals in the cigarette or any tobacco product. And psychological dependence, because we know this is behavioral and in fact considered in the ICD-10 ICD as a behavioral or um, habit or a dependence. Sociocultural, of course, is the effect of our peers, of our friends, the community or the group what we work with, influencing us to uh, go into the bad habit of smoking. So this is what um, it is under in a major substance dependence, smoking. So these are the characteristics of substance dependence and ICD code is F17. So we know and it has been established that smoking is an addictiveness. And these are the DSM or the ICD code Z72 and F17.2. It is the most efficient delivery device, better than intravenous. And the high dose of arterial nicotine can cause upregulation of the nicotine acetylcholine receptors. And they ha there has been some studies that shows genetic factors can also influence the dependence, but I think this is one avenue or area which has not really been extensively looked into yet. And if left untreated, 60% of the smokers die from a tobacco-caused disease. Okay, so this is how nicotine, okay, prese um, presents or acts on the receptors. It binds preferentially to nicotinic acetylcholinergic receptors in the CNS. Specifically, the alpha-4 beta-2 nicotinic receptor in the ventral tegmental area. They result in the release of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, which is believed to be linked to reward. Okay, so it is two-way. Smoking reinforces, is reinforced in two ways. The positive reinforcement because of the positive effects in the body, the feeling of euphoria, of uh, complacency and relaxation which is because of the direct receptor stimulation. And this is manifested especially for heavy smokers in the first cigarette of the day where there is really the powerful reinforcement effect. A negative reinforcement is that a smoker would want to avoid the withdrawal signs and symptoms. That's why it would need to be hooked up to smoking. It is recorded that there are 200 to 300 discrete boluses of nicotine to the brain per day in a heavy smoker. So in itself, nicotine is not the one which is carcinogen. It is in a liquid state, but it is really the addictive effect of nicotine that exposes us to the 7,000 harmful chemicals 
contained in the cigarette and other tobacco products. The inhalation peaks in its concentration two to four times the venous concentration and the half-life is 120 minutes. What about the deleterious effect of smoking in the airways? I need to emphasize this because we know in its relationship to COVID-19, COVID is primarily attacking the respiratory symptoms. So the smoking or the chemicals in the cigarette would induce airway inflammation with influx of chronic inflammatory cells, mediators, cytokines, which also very much identified in the severity of COVID-19, proteolytic enzymes, which cause inflammatory damage further augmented by oxidative stress, leading to small airway fibrosis with parenchymal destruction, abnormal repair, disrupted defense mechanisms, resulting to airflow limitations, air trapping, gas exchange abnormalities, and increase in high mucus. Okay? What about, and these of course, all result to reduce lung function. And tobacco has been identified and as a single most important factor in the pathogenesis of COPD in 80 to 90% of cases. And in the US, 80% of COPD who eventually died were smokers. We had an unpublished data in the Philippines sometime in 2014 by Dr. Dantes. And based on history of smoking, he was able to show that 19% of males with 10 to 20 pack years and 25% with more than 20 pack years had spirometry consistent with COPD. Okay, what about smoking and its relationship with other diseases? With asthma, the tobacco smoke damages cilia in the lungs, permanently damaging the airways, modifying inflammation associated with asthma, causing bronchial irritation, increased bronchial responsiveness, and airway sensitization to several occupational allergens. So it duplicates, it triplicates, it doubles the hypersensitivity of asthma. With pneumonia, it induces both act the active and passive smoking are already established risk factors for community acquired pneumonia and its severity. Cigarette is also very much identified with the non-communicable diseases and for cerebrovascular disease, it accelerates atherosclerosis, promotes acute ischemic events with hemodynamic stress, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, endothelial injury and dysfunction, atherogenic lipid profile, profile and enhanced agulability, arrhythmogenesis, and relative hypoxemia. Now, what about with viral infection? Cigarette smoking is a substantial risk factor for viral infections. COVID-19 being a viral infection will also lead to structural changes in the respiratory tract and immune response. The influenza risk, including COVID-19, is several folds higher and more severe in smokers than non-smokers. And studies have shown that smoking predisposes young men to more severe influenza and higher influenza-related mortality in a dose-dependent fashion. Now, I have to insert here and remind everyone that tobacco or smoking is not only the tobacco products. No? There are other nicotine delivery products, and we have to remember that this is part or other products that we want to control or we want to abate or um, stop. You know? And examples of the alternative tobacco and nicotine delivery products will include e-cigarettes and vaping, the smokeless tobacco and water pipes. They may come in various forms, sizes, and flavors. And alternative tobacco products may also contain harm and not make, they also contain harmful chemicals and toxins that have established health risks. They cause serious health problems, including cancer as well. The aerosols contained in this non-nicotine um, delivery device are known toxicants. They have known health effects resulting in significant pathologic changes. While the level of known toxicants on the average may be lower than cigarette smoke, they contain metals such as lead, cadmium, nickel will have been which have been found in concentration equal to traditional cigarette. So while they may be less toxic than the cigarette smoke, which at this time we cannot accept this anymore, 
it is as equal if not more harmful. The electronic non-nicotine device system are unlikely to be harmless. No? They are not harmless at all. And the long-term use is expected to increase increasing the risk of COPD or chronic pulmonary diseases and cardiovascular disease and cancer. So they say that it is a safer alternative, but not because they create harm lung tissue, much like the regular cigarettes do. Without or without nicotine, the e-cigarette vapor increases inflammation, disable these cells, which protect lung tissue. And harming these cells make them vulnerable to dust, bacteria, and allergens, including viruses, that might lead to incurable chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease and even death. Okay. Is this true? No, it's not. Because uh, with, I, I think Dr. David is here with us with permission. I borrowed this from her deck of slides. It is never as safer than a cigarette. Okay. Just take a look of the chemicals in the cigarette. Equal, if not more, are those found in e-cigarette or the vape pen, vape pen aerosol. And e-cigarette becomes a bridge to cigarette use. There has been a um, finding of the pop -col, pop -col, popcorn lung, which has been established some two years ago. So it may be a rare condition that causes airway scarring due to inflammation led by inhaling the inhaling the acetyl components in the vape and e-cigarette. They lead to lung damage. Uh, treatment exists to limit and manage symptoms. There is no cure for popcorn lungs, and it is considered life-threatening. So additional risks are bronchiolitis obliterans. They cause Inflammation and scarring, constrictions of the lung tissue, causing decrease in or even loss of lung function, which can be fatal. So this slide is also borrowed from Dr. David. They have reported hypersensitivity pneumonitis, even in the pediatrics age group. And in Guam, they have reported a young adult that presented with difficulty in breathing and blood in the sputum, who is... This patient is an aggressive vapor and have had ramp up in vaping immediately prior to symptoms. In the Philippines, there was a reported 16 years old somewhere in the Visayas, a young patient presenting with COPD manifestations uh, cannot be identified, never a cigarette smoker, but has been using and has been doubling the use of vaping in the past months before the onset of the, the symptoms and the worsening clinical presentation. So now this is quite important as well. Vape or e-cigarettes becomes an instrument of transmitting bacteria, fungi, and even viruses. No? So let's be wary, let's be um, on guard. The use of vaping instruments or gadget being borrowed or transmitted from one patient, a person to the other, is one device of transmitting the COVID-19 virus as well, okay? And in the most extreme damage, a man has died or died after his e-cigarette exploded in his face. There is a new gadget that they use, the Juul. If you see here, this is just like, a, similar to just a USB, but this is a non-burning um, liquid um, gadget but it uses liquid nicotine and the equivalent, if you look here, one pack of cigarette is equal to one jewel pod, which is just 0.7 ml. But if you use the two ml cartridge, which is 5.4% nicotine by volume, it is equivalent to three packs of cigarettes, which is 60 sticks. No? So if one user, uh, Use this a day. It's like a Doctor Yeah. Yes. I think no. Can you see? Can you hear me, Marika? You were saying something. Am I not heard?
We can hear you, Dr. Mateo. You um, can hear us? Can you be? Maricar, uh, no, we can't, we can't hear you. Hi, Malik. Hi, Malik. Uh, okay, lang, okay, lang. 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 Okay, all of these are known to almost everyone, I'm sure. It's, uh, it can progress to severe acute respiratory syn syndrome with pneumonia or just a plain acute respiratory distress syndrome. Diagnosis by detection of the viral RNA by reverse transcriptase PCR. It shows diffuse alveolar damage histologically and the sites affected for the mild disease is the upper respiratory tract, but once it goes down, to the bilateral lobes of the lungs, it becomes more severe. The viral infection is capable of producing excessive immune reaction in the host, and it leads to may lead to cytokine storm. If you remember the previous slide about smoking, it it also induces an increase in cytokine um, cells, no? And it can cause extensive tissue damage with dysfunctional coagulation. So if you look. Up here, I don't need to enumerate everyone, uh, all of this. You'd see the similarity of its effect as in smoking, all right? So if you double the effect of smoking with the lung pathology in COVID-19, this will start to result to a catastrophic uh, outcome, okay? WHO issued in May 11 some of statements, which I think is important, which I think are important and must be remembered by all of our participants. COVID-19, an infectious disease, primarily attacking the lungs. So an immunocompromised lung in a smoker will lead to a, a severe illness. Smoking impairs the lung function, and it's hard for it to fight off coronaviruses and other diseases. Diseases, tobacco is also a risk factor for NCDs, and it has been identified in the cases, the severe cases of COVID-19, that they have cardiovascular and other non-communicable diseases worsening even in the um, end of the spectrum of the illness. Therefore, smokers are at higher risk of developing severe COVID illness and even death. Okay, So WHO reviewed also um, studies, and they reported this in April 29 of this year. And they found that smokers are more likely to develop severe diseases with COVID-19 compared to non-smokers. But WHO also stresses the importance of ethically approved high quality systematic research that will contribute to advancing individual and public health. Emphasizing the promotion of unproven interventions could have a negative impact. Why am I focusing on this slide? Because there have been reports that nicotine in itself can be used to lessen the negative effect or the negative impact of COVID-19 that is unproven and should not be taken as a fact. In fact, these are baseless declaration or statements. Okay? So COVID-19, it's detrimental to immune system. And there was a systematic review of the evidence done by the team of Vardabas and Nikitara in March. And they, I would go to, so out of 71 review study, studies reviewed, they just uh, included five relevant or significant ones. And in their finding, uh, this is a retrospective and prospective method. And the uh, time period is from December to January. And they found that in the largest study included, they were, there were higher percentage of current and former smokers among patients that needed ICU support, mechanical ventilation, or who have died, and a higher percentage of smokers among the severe cases. They extrapolated and computed, and they found that the smokers were 1.4 times more likely to have severe symptoms of COVID-19 and approximately 2.4 times more likely to be admitted to an ICU would need mechanical ventilation 
or would even die compared to non-smokers. So in conclusion, in this meta-analysis, they said that smoking is most likely associated with negative progression and adverse outcome of COVID-19. All right, so now we, we move then to why must someone or a smoker quit smoking? I think this is these are four statements that can be very handy to our practitioners in relating and encouraging our smokers to quit. No? Just these four lines will give them motivation to quit. So tell them that within 20 minutes of quitting, the elevated heart rate and blood pressure will drop. And after 12 hours of quitting, the carbon monoxide level in the blood drops to normal. And within two to 12 weeks, so we're right now in the running fourth month of the pandemic. So they still have time to quit so that they will see improvement in, in their immune system. And after one to nine months coughing, shortness of breath decrease. And this is quite important, hopefully not, that they don't contract the COVID-19, but they already have a defense one day, defense once they quit smoking. Okay, other benefits will be, of course, economic benefits benefits in this time when we, so most of the lower and middle class are short of resources, quitting will render them a little more amount per month if they quit. This is about 678 pesos spent for cigarette. This is found in the Global Adult Tobacco Survey in 2019. And, and considering the is increasing cost of cigarette, I'm sure this has reached to um, saving at least a thousand per month if they quit smoking. So it, it can also forego high cost of utilization of medical services and resources due to medical disabilities due to smoking cessation. Social benefits, of course, after quitting, patients will feel less isolated. Okay, They can, do not need to look for smoking areas which are restricted to other non-smokers. No? They can be more productive since time spent previously to look for a smoking area or buy cigarettes have been dramatically reduced, okay? So what are the tobacco control initiatives in the Philippines? So we've done this since mid 1990s with Yossi Kadiri till 2003 with, when we came out or the law on the tobacco regulation, which is the Republic Act 9211. And to date, we have the DOH National Smoking Cessation Program and there are a few, a number of organizations and agencies involved in tobacco control strategies. Of course, Department of Health being the lead, all its attached agencies and hospitals, whether the national or local hospitals are mandated to have smoking cessation programs. MMDA is a very um, active partner. FCAP is a mother agency with so many agencies, organizations under it. The ASH, PCP, of course, PCCP and WHO, the Western Pacific Region Office, and our counterpart um, organization here under WHO. So what do we focus on? We build on a cessation program system. You can start even as an individual with brief advice, then refer to a smoking cessation clinic on intensive counseling, which can include medical treatment. So this is just an example of the initiatives that we have done. The Philippine College of Physicians came out in 2017 at Clinical Practice Guidelines on the Diagnosis and Treatment of Tobacco Use and Dependence. It is up for a second edition already. You can catch this in our website or request our secretariat for hard copies if you want. And this focus and anchors on the five A's, the AS Advice CIS, Assess, assist, arrange, anticipate as the brief advice intervention. Okay. Um, all right. So tobacco control, but must then go beyond health issues. It should address other aspects of tobacco epidemic. And to succeed, succeed must be handled as a public health and political movement. Okay. Once again, in the new normal, no smoking must be strengthened. And I'd like to thank everyone. Let's stay safe and be smoke free. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mateo. So, uh, 
kindly hold on to your questions after our second speaker, Dr. Uh, Susan Merca Mercado. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Maricar and Dr. Panaligan for this opportunity to join to join you at this uh, this very important discussion on COVID, tobacco, and, and the new normal. Um, okay, let me put my slides on. Okay, so um, I think the new normal, when we talk about the new normal, that's not a, a static thing, right? It's not something that we can say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten is the new normal. I think the new normal is something that's a process. It's changing. It's constantly changing as we, we begin to understand more about COVID-19. And um, we all have to be part of shaping the new normal. And I think what we want is for the new normal to be a better normal than what we had before. I think uh, what has happened, COVID-19, gives us a fresh opportunity to strengthen our efforts in tobacco control. But um, I think we have to face some realities. And one of these realities is that COVID is here to stay. Um, I always like to start with a photograph of the earth because public health is in fact global. And just to remind us that what we're going through right now is not unique to the Philippines. The whole world is suffering from COVID and from the reactions of people to COVID and from the reactions of the reactions of people to COVID and whether or not people trust their governments or trust the people who are in charge. Uh, there are so many, so many problems that have come up because of COVID-19. So it's important for us to find the perspective and find a way to continue what we're doing in public health because while COVID is um, a global phenomenon, it is not the only public health issue that we have. And as we begin to understand it more, I think uh, we'll have to accept that this disease is going to be with us, but we are going to become better at diagnosing it, managing it, treating it, and eventually controlling it. So COVID is affecting all aspects of our lives. It, I would say that from a sort of social determinants point of view. It affects the way we interact with other people. So the boundaries that we have to create, we can't congregate. Uh, we, we're not supposed to be touching each other, et cetera. Uh, so those are kind of like interpersonal boundaries. And then there are the social boundaries that are created. So for us uh, here in the Philippines, you can't cross from one province to another and so on. Um, we can barely travel and um, I think uh, for those who are working uh, and let's say who are seniors, then they can't go back to work, right? So those who have risks are prevented from, there's, there's a restriction or there's a boundary from working. And so we have to find new ways of working. Uh, kids can't go to school. So we have to find new ways of, of learning. So it's affected different parts of our lives. And um, it is very important for us to remember that some of the restrictions are temporary and some of these may change over time. So we have to be agile. We have to be um, nimble. We should be able to adjust as we develop better understanding of, of the virus. So uh, typically in, in a pandemic, it usually starts with an outbreak. This is what we saw in China. You have an outbreak, you have an epidemic, and then it becomes pandemic. And so I guess in the new normal, what we're expecting is that from a pandemic where you have everything out of control everywhere, you start moving into places, into sort of localization of, of the outbreak so that you have um, less community transmission in certain countries. Some countries bring it down very, very low. So everybody starts controlling it. But I don't think you can completely eradicate it. Although they were saying New Zealand also only has one case or something like that. Unless well, if they open their borders and airplanes start flying in, then that won't be one case anymore. So I think the situation for COVID might be that it might become endemic, though in the same way that dengue is endemic, in the same way that 
uh, malaria is endemic in some areas or yellow fever, it's just there. And then we will expect also that you would see certain places where you might have outbreaks or groups of people or clusters of people who have the infection. So I think from going completely out of control, at least here in the Philippines, we have a greater sense of control, but we are seeing outbreaks like in Cebu, like Tondo has an outbreak right now. So it's changing, it's changing rapidly and we need to adjust and adapt. Okay, now just to put a little perspective into the public health magnitude of COVID-19, and, and I know uh, I shouldn't make this comparison because we still don't know that much about COVID. We've seen so many of our mentors die. Uh, we've had health workers in hospitals who continue to get sick and so on. But if we take a look at the burden of disease of tobacco, which results in 8 million deaths a year, and we compare it to the number of deaths of COVID. Now, I'm not saying that uh, this is not a tragedy. It is. And unless there is control, this will continue to, to spiral to spiral out and become exponential. Just for perspective, I has already pointed out that there is a connection between um, the severity of COVID and the fact that so many people have non-communicable diseases, diseases of the heart, hypertension, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which all interact negatively with COVID. So it becomes one more, one more big public health issue that we need to we need to understand further and that we need to, to address. Okay, so um, so tobacco use as a uh, as a risk factor of chronic disease then becomes a risk factor for COVID, as you can see the interactions and as it has been presented. And I think a lot of people who are smoking and vaping understand this. They understand it. They know it and they're actually afraid uh, that they're still smoking and they're still vaping and they could get COVID. But we need to take advantage of that opportunity to provide opportunities for people to stop smoking. Because without that, uh, they've got nicotine addiction, right? So we have to help make information available for people who want to quit because they know that it is a risk for them. But there's much more that we need to do. All right, so let's look at the latest evidence on assessment of risks of COVID-19. Um, we know now that you have greater risk of getting COVID-19 in indoor spaces rather than outdoors. We also know that narrow spaces indoors have a greater possibility of people getting COVID than large, well-ventilated spaces. We also know that where you have high density of people, siksikan, that's where you have more of a risk. Where compared to uh, compared to being in compared to being in a situation where uh, you are you are in a place where very few people are, so you're running, you're walking, etc. And then we also know that longer interaction with people creates higher risk than short exposures. So you talk for a few minutes and that's it. We also know that symptomatics are more likely to drive infection than asymptomatics. Although there is still a risk among asymptomatics, they keep on changing what the figure is. At some point, if they said it was 15%, then it's 20%. So there is a risk on both, but more of a risk when you have somebody who's coughing and sneezing and touching objects. And then we also know now that the early part of the infection, uh, the early part of having COVID-19 is the time when you are most likely to infect others. In fact, the recent guidelines that were released by the Department of Health stated that at day 14, you could already uh, release a person from quarantine from the start of symptoms because uh, CDC, WHO, Singapore, Taiwan, all, all these countries that were able to do culturing of the virus have said that after day 10, day 11, the virus may test positive on a PCR, but it's not viable. When you culture it, it no longer grows. So it seems that the infectious period is right before the symptoms start and at the height of the symptoms, which means that 
the crazy quarantine that has happened in the Philippines that some people have been in quarantine for for 30 days or so is something that uh, is something that has to has to be modified and when the department of health came out with their um with their guidelines i was also saying to them that uh they should explain this thing about viability of the virus because you can keep on testing the virus so uh you know there was a study in singapore they were testing everything they tested the bed the toilet seat of a patient in a in a hospital with a patient they tested everything and everything was uh, on PCR positive for virus, but they could not culture it to live. So there is more that we're learning about uh, COVID. And the more we learn about it, the easier it will be for us to start creating the new and better normal. Okay, so there are some challenges that we face. And that's because, of course, apart from... Uh, tobacco being bad for health is that you've got a vector, right? You've got an industry. And the tobacco industry has been contributing to, as in donating. So here in the Philippines, uh, you know, big tobacco has been giving out food. They've been giving support. They've been visible out there. So contributing to, but also exploiting the COVID response. Now, I, I was planning to show you the, this, but I'll just advise you to look this up so that you can see it yourself. It's on www.campaignasia.com. The article is Big Tobacco Using COVID-19 for Messaging and Influencers to Market Products. And what they do is that on social media, they have these um, promotions where they say that stay, you know, hashtag stay at home and um, please order online your cigarettes or e-cigarettes and we're going to give it to you for discount. Plus, we're going to give you a branded mask. Right? Or a branded hand sanitizer or something like that. And there are also campaigns like a BD a day. This was in uh, this is in uh, in, in um, South Asia. A BD a day keeps the pulmonologist away. So they've used this this sheltering at home or stay at home or quarantine as an opportunity to say that to relax at home, you should smoke or vape. So I want you to look at that because. Uh, it, it's just it's just unbelievable what these people are doing. No? So you've got the tobacco industry, and that's a challenge for us. Now, right before the uh, start of the enhanced community quarantine here, we were doing hearings already on uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems and heated tobacco products, and all that has been on hold as most of our public health programs have been on hold. In fact, uh, like vaccination has dropped to an all-time low and so on and so forth. So including our work on tobacco control has been sidelined, but we should pick it up. I think my message is this is a good opportunity as we are entering the new better normal, we should pick it up. Okay, so what are some of the solutions? All right, so social distancing hand washing and masks are going to be the sort of pillars of staying safe in the new better normal. So we have to keep at least a meter away from people, avoid crowds. We should be frequently washing our hands, uh, minding what we touch, um, disinfecting things like phones and using our masks and using our masks properly. So the mask, the hand washing, the social distancing are all uh, interconnected. Now, in my work with uh, with um, the private sector, corporations in particular, uh, this this issue came out. Right? It's like, how do you do smoking social distancing in a smoking designated area? And I allowed them to solve this problem, right? Because they said people are usually crowded in a smoking designated area. So if we're going to make a smoking designated area, people should be at least three meters away from each other because when they puff, what are they puffing, right? And then how many can be inside the smoking designated area at one time? So we have to have somebody watching it, et cetera, et cetera. And some of our colleagues in the private sector has just said, you know, the thing to do is no more smoking designated area. Just take it out because you cannot have a safe smoking designated area as far as COVID is concerned, not that smoking is not dangerous, but 
it just put into question the whole thing about can you keep a social distance, right? So I think we should look at that. This is an opportunity for us to remove smoking designated areas in the workplace. Then, of course, there's the question of hands and keeping your hands clean. And can you really smoke without touching your mouth or your lips? So para a smoker, of course, you touch only the cigarette, no? But or or the you know, the device, but it's very like you're bringing your hands close to your mouth. Eh? It's almost like eating. So there is a risk involved here if your hands are dirty, right? So again, another public uh, public health message for people because we're telling them to wear masks. Of course, you can't smoke if you're wearing a mask. So you have to take off your mask, right? And then you have to open your whatever, do whatever you need to do. So the risk is there, no? Now, I saw this in one of the articles and thought it'd be interesting to share with you, which is viral particle dispersal uh, needed for infection. And it's estimated that you need 1,000 viral particles to get infected with anything. Now, of course, people are asking me, how did they actually do this study? I said, of course, they didn't try it, right? Because that would be unethical to you know, put somebody in front and then try to measure the particles that are coming out. These are based on estimations that have been done in animal studies and for other diseases. And uh, Japan has done some of these studies with visualization of uh, visualization of viral particles and doing estimations. But they're saying that by breathing, you could be dispersing about 20 viral particles per minute. Speaking, so speaking and actually singing has even more, no? You have more viral particle dispersals every minute. But coughing is about 200 million viral particles and sneezing is about the same. So what is it for smoking? Now, I was researching and just couldn't find anything. But there was a British uh, group that actually said that puffing smoke is almost like spitting in terms of the impact or the trajectory and the number of viral particles that, that could go into your face if you're close enough to another person. So clearly, the act of smoking creates uh, a risk for transmission of COVID. All right, so let's go into what we need to do. And I found that um, just going back to very basic uh, framework, the very basic framework of health promotion could be helpful for us in the new normal. And health promotion defined as the process of enabling people to take control of their health and their lives means that we empower and enable people to make decisions about how they're going to live in a better way in the new, better normal. And eliminating tobacco from the new normal should be everybody's goal, not only because of the risk of COVID, but also because of the well-known risks of tobacco. So um, going back to the Ottawa Charter, there are five key actions, and you're all very familiar with this. Developing personal skills. No? And in COVID, this is very important that we have presence of mind, that we're not absent-minded. And I must admit, I've gone to the market several times without a mask, only to run back to the car when I saw a, when I saw a sign that said, no mask, no entry. Okay, So wearing a mask is a skill. And staying away from people who are smoking is a skill. You have to learn it. You have to practice it. You have to remind people. And... Um, if we want new behaviors, then we have to create supportive environments. Ito na yung create supportive environments. No? I was thinking earlier, what if for every sign that says no mass, no entry, it also says no smoking? Diba? Kasi, ano, na, parang you're always you have to constantly remind people through visual cues in their environment. Now, the community also needs to take action. So, I think if people know more about the effects or the inter interconnections between COVID and tobacco use and the potential for spread of COVID through the act of smoking or puffing, then I think uh, we could probably have stricter enforcement of no smoking policies in local areas. But then going to building healthy public policy, this is an opportunity for the tobacco control community to do more than just addressing localized settings. And then, of course, there's the whole issue of cessation. 
my understanding, and I think if we did a little survey on this, is that you have more people now who want to quit because they've stayed home. They began, began to think about their life, their health. They've seen people die. They've heard of people get sick. And they know that smoking is not good for them. But they also need the tools to stop smoking. So our health systems need to be able to provide that. And for us, for the doctors who are listening, we should be available to give good advice on how one can quit smoking. So in the context of health promotion, we also think about very simply, uh, how do we get our messages out in the settings where people live, work, learn, and play? So it's not enough for us to do just a workplace or just to look at communities. We have to look at all of the environment and how you can get things done in the elemental settings uh, where we are. Okay, so just to say that um, sustained television advertising uh, is very important in tobacco control. And we have an opportunity now to do advertising on tobacco and COVID. We haven't, you know, that door, that window of opportunity for advocacy is there, but we're not jumping into the window yet. So we need to jump into that window before the window closes. This is the time to do it. This is the time to remind people that tobacco increases your risk for severe COVID, that nicotine does not prevent uh, COVID, et cetera, et cetera. So we could launch and ride on this current uh, awareness about COVID and about health. I think there has been no time in recent history when there has been such a focus on health. So we have to use this opportunity to talk about tobacco. Okay. Now, this is an opportunity also to amend Republic Act 2092-11. Um, I testified in Congress a couple of weeks back. And when I said this, there were a number of legislators who picked up on it and said, yeah, we should really remove smoking designated areas from the law, really enforce complete bans on smoking everywhere, um, really remove point of sale advertising, and so on and so forth. So I think we need to pick it up. Pick it up again and just go for it because give the health argument, people are listening when we're talking about health. And definitely because people are still staying home, we have to say no smoking at home because you're going to get all your seniors sick. So let's take advantage of this opportunity that we have. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done on uh, virtual and remote uh messaging for cessation. Uh, there was a big project that got awarded for the Philippines, WHO awarded the Philippines for this. And there's much more, no? Um, if we look at uh, quit lines and websites, and many of the doctors are now going online, um, this is an opportunity for us to not just deal with illness, but to deal with risk factors, tobacco being a risk factor that can be modified. Now, let's not lose sight of the bigger picture here. And again, you know, tobacco industry is on opening with COVID-19 to be a good corporate citizen by giving away food and so on. And uh, advertising, giving away masks with branding. And uh, so I think we have to push this forward and level up. And we should level up by going for standardized packaging or plain packaging, as they call it. And apparently, there is a bill that has been filed, and we should move in that direction. So we keep on moving forward. We don't let COVID be a setback. We look at it as an opportunity to propel uh, tobacco control. There's also the issue of banning the display of cigarettes. So this has been very effective in many parts of the world. We should work on that. Um, and then we should continue to push for higher tobacco taxes. Um, I think in short, we have to continue to do what we were doing, but to do it better. And um, I'll just end by saying that uh, we have to keep on articulating the fact that this industry would even use COVID-19 to advertise its product. I mean, it, it's just unbelievable, but uh, when I saw these ads that they were doing and I've seen how they've been 
helping out in the pandemic response and how people have been so helpless that they couldn't say no to it. It just it's just so painful. No? So we have to keep on working on Article 5.3 and advocating for uh, government and organizations to not accept tobacco industry support and to stop their interference in all the things we do in public health. So um, just to end, I think, uh, again, using health promotion framework, as doctors, we need to be advocates. We need to be part of social mobilization and joining groups. And it's interesting, you know, before when you talk about joining group, groups, that means physically being in a group. But I think somehow uh, having this enhanced community quarantine and having access to all these virtual meeting platforms has a way of drawing us closer and is, is a way of getting people together and bringing together our ideas, having a convergence of ideas on how to move forward and being unified in our work for public health. And then, of course, health education, which is talking to our individual patients, helping them one at a time. Before I, before I end, I just wanted to say that um, the problems of COVID are very real. Uh, yesterday, I had to help a patient who actually came from Los Angeles. And uh, he was the cousin of a doctor who's a friend of ours who said, you know, Susie, can you help and find out what the result of the, the test is, right? So this was done through the government side and it was done at the Red Cross. So I got the test and it turned out to be positive. So when I talked to the patient, I was like, okay, um, syempre, natakot siya, no? But then told me that in his home in Los Angeles, six people were sick and one of them died. And so he wanted to come home to be in Leyte, in Bye Bye Leyte, possibly thinking that I, I just need to get out of where I was to a safer place. But it also meant that he was actually on a plane five days ago and was positive when he arrived here. So um, I think, uh, now when I talked to him, uh, I asked him, uh, how are you feeling? You know, uh, how's the day been for you, et cetera, et cetera. And I asked, you know, is there, do you have any illness? You know, and he goes, no, 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 I don't. Okay, so I said, what medications are you taking? And he named an antihypertensive drug. So when we're talking to our patients, sometimes I guess uh, how we ask or what we do and how we sort of yeah. educate is very, very important because you may ask a question and the answer is no. But then when you dig a little deeper, you find that ah, the answer is yes. I mean, there was another patient I had who swore that he never, ever, ever left the house. He was a good boy. He stayed home and all of that. And I said, what were you doing on May 26? They looks at this calendar. Oh, I went to the community. Okay. Were you wearing a mask? No. <laughs> okay. Right? So... I think um, people are overwhelmed by the pandemic. I think um, we have to be a voice of calm, a voice of reason, and a voice of logic. Because there's so much information out there. There's so much <laughs> panic out there. There's so much confusion. That our role in health education now is so important, has never been more important. And that means reaching out to that individual patient that you have, providing a voice of calm, helping understand how you're going to help. And if you have smokers, really getting them to quit. This is the moment to help them. So I think I'll end on that note and just want to thank everyone and please be Marikar and everyone for this opportunity to join. Marami salamat. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sosi Mercado. Uh, so we were able to get from our two speakers the most important points. No, first the science behind uh, smoking and um, and COVID nineteen, and then the solutions. No, Dr. Mercado talk about the solutions to further reduce the. Um, 
the problems that we are encountering in COVID-19 and uh, tobacco control. So um, with that, I'd like to probably open now the floor for any questions no, coming from our uh, attendees. Now, while you are still thinking no, of the possible questions you want to ask, can I... Um, can I start the ball rolling by asking the first question? So I think uh, my first question is directed to Dr. Uh, Mateo. Uh, I guess that um, you probably have also read an article um, that I uh, in published in in a, in a newspaper about the study on nicotine and the prevention of COVID-19. So can you give us a comment on right. that? Of course, these are claims. In fact, they have no scientific basis or uh, they're not even a legitimate clinical trials or study. And we are all in science. We have to be evidence-based. So we don't rely on such claim or statements. In fact, that's the reason why, if you remember one of my slides, focus on WHO um, stating that we should be wary and should be careful in uh, applying or taking in, accepting statements that are unfounded and not science-based. No? Definitely, if they're saying it's nicotine, it has really no effect at all. And there has never been any study that correlates its relationship with treatment of a viral infection. In fact, um, the nicotine's ability to have one be uh, addicted to the use of a delivery device will expose that patient or that person to more harmful chemicals that renders the immune system of that person below or even compromised. So if I may state based on science and what we have studied, it is the other way around. No? It has no role in the treatment or abating or even making COVID-19 a less severe form. Um, let's, let, we're all scientists here, so let's not be swayed okay, by just, just because it's published in the newspaper that we are to believe it. So that's my point of view. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Uh, An Annette David is also with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you please, um, maybe you can further uh, give some comment on this, uh, Dr. Andy? Hi, Maricar. Hi, Amy, and hi, Susie. Hi. I think always when it comes to any sort of publication, it's so important to question the source. Yes. And I think what you will find is that some of these articles that purport to be uh, showing evidence of nicotine being protective against COVID are in fact funded or are written by researchers whose funding grants come from the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. And you might think that that is a good source for research grants, but in fact, that is a foundation that is entirely put up by Philip Morris. So uh, the source is always very important to check as well. Thank Wonderful you. presentations, thank you. Thank you, Annette. With permission, uh -huh. use some of your slides. <laughs> <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> thank you, Annette, thank you. Uh, also with us is Dr. Migo uh, Mantaring uh, from the Department of Health. Um, Migo, actually, I cannot see the, the panel anymore. So maybe uh, you have some way, like if there are any questions and answers, if you can help me uh, post those questions and answers. Uh, those uh, questions. Can I, can I present here in the forum? I saw one question about okay. uh, the, the way COVID-19 is transmitted. Uh, it says there the one who posed that question is it's uh, drop 
airborne, no? It's airborne and how can it be transmitted? So it's not, well, there has been statement that it can be airborne, but in first and foremost, it has been associated as an aerosol. It's aerosolized, no? It's bigger than just a airborne being uh, drifted in the environment or the air. And this is really linked to vaping and e-cigarette because the vaping, the principle of vaping and e-cigarette is really acerolizing, okay? So uh, it's consistent with how the COVID-19 virus is transmitted as an aerosol, okay? It, and let's not be confused with vapor because vapor is just pure water being uh, evaporated in the air, no? What the chemicals being used in the e-cigarette e and vapes are aerosolized chemicals, so, which is consistent with how also the virus is transmitted. So when an infected person uses vaping, they can easily transmit it to another person by, as what Dr. Pineda said, even you know, uh, exhaling the smoke is like equivalent to spitting out the secretions and aerosolizing your secretions and the harmful chemicals. So I guess that's been answered yeah, in the, in the Q&A chat room or uh, I just had to present it to all the participants to be able to share the principle of transmission, both of chemicals in the e-cigarette and vape and aerosolizing or transmitting the virus with aerosol uh, or not really droplets. Okay. So Miguel, Mike is here with us. Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we we have one question for here. Um, could would anyone like to comment on betel nut chewers at as it is also similar to cigarette nicotine? So we know it's prevalent in the provinces who 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 use this as a form of uh, a nicotine replacement or a, a form of uh, a vice. For would anyone like to comment on the betel nut? I'll comment on that. I mean, um, in the Pacific, where betel nut chewing, of course, Andy is here. She might want to say something too. Yeah. I mean, where betel nut chewing is cultural, no? Even kids in uh, preschool, they already have their chew. And I think the unfortunate thing is that they now mix the nut with the leaf that they chew. And then they put a cigarette on it and they chew that. Now, the practice in the Philippines, so that's why in the Pacific, some of the highest rates of oral cancer are seen in areas where they chew betel nut. Um, and when they add that cigarette to the chew, the thing that they chew, it becomes even worse. No, um, I don't know if in the Philippines we chew the cigarette itself. We, there might be places where they chew betel nut plus the tobacco leaf. I'm not sure. But these are all carcinogenic, no? So, merong problema talaga ito. This is really something that needs to be stopped. But it's very difficult to regulate it. Very, very difficult to regulate it. Andy might want to say a few more things on that. Andy, ano ba? <laughs> Chewing. Andy tried to do something about this. Ang hirap talaga, eh, no? Oh, yung ano, yung chewing uh, tobacco with betel nut. Dito sa amin, sa Guam, sa Micronesia, it's very prevalent and we have data on children. Wala. Na-disconnect si Andy. Yeah, yeah. Can you yeah there you are. Oh, kasi I was saying that double whammy yan, kasi ang betel nut in itself is a recognized human carcinogen under IARC. Tapos dagdagan mo pa yan ng tobacco, which is another established human carcinogen, and the effect is not just additive, it's, it's synergistic. So that is a double, uh, double bad thing for anyone's health. And then keep in mind also the betel nut increases your hand-to-mouth behavior. So the transmission for the virus, the pathways for transmission, the likelihood is increased. Yeah. Uh, so if I may add, you know, in the Philippines, I think um, betel nut uh, chewing is one of, of the growing concerns in the mountain area. You no. Know? So that in the mountain province, 
uh, that is one of the major concerns that are being seen right now. So with smoking, because of like, let us uh, uh, because of the strong uh, tobacco control measures as far as smoking is concerned. So we are now seeing a reduction in the smoking prevalence, but uh, according to our friends in Baguio and in the mountain province area, they are seeing now an increasing uh, or a rising trend in the use of metal nut. No, so I think that is something that uh, we need also to look at um, in the very near future. Um, uh, there is one question here from uh, from Mr. Inigo Garingalao of Iloilo. Um, the he said that confinement, restrictions, anxiety, and, and of course addiction during quarantine uh, can it add can add to smoking. So uh, can you comment on this? The confinement itself, what is happening right now, it, it, uh, he is ask, asking if it can possibly add to the uh, need to smoke or the desire to smoke. Uh, I, I, go ahead, I mean, go na muna. I think I was about to say you have properly explained that, no? but yes, the temptation of smoking if you're quarantined and not doing anything, of course, is very high, right? You don't, you have no other things to do, so you turn to smoking. And then if you smoke within the home, you are not jeopardizing not only your health, but also those within your family, you expose them to secondhand smoke, okay? Anxiety is one of the major reasons why people smoke. They would say because smoking relaxes them, yeah, it makes them um, complacent, concentrate more. I guess it really compounds and the factors that would push one into smoking. No? And they can, they, the, the space, the enclosed space, of course, the contained smoke. And remember, we're not talking about only secondhand smoke. The thirdhand smoke, if you're in a confined area, stays for a longer time than secondhand smoke. Yes, definitely it adds up. It compounds the risk with the act of smoking. So I guess Susie, you can still add more to. Yeah, sure. Just a little to add on to what Amy said. No, um, there was a recent SWS survey that came out that said that nine out of ten Filipinos are stressed out because of of COVID. And um, in counseling patients who are trying to quit, uh, this often comes up that, as Amy says, smoking helps them relax. But you see. The problem is, and when you process this, you talk to a smoker about it, they also realize that while it helps them relax, that effect is very short. And so there is uh, a bit of relaxation that happens. But then if you're really stressed out, you want more, right? Because you, de you develop tolerance. So the more you smoke, the more you want to smoke because you have, as I may have mentioned, upregulation of your nicotine receptors. You stimulate them more and you get to a point where you just keep on wanting more and more. That is the, the nature of addiction. So then, so when you get to a part when you want more and more, but you can't get it, then you're more stressed out and you're more tense. So I think, um, again, right, when we reach out to patients and try to help them reflect on that, okay, you're stressed out, then you smoke, then what happens? Then you feel good. Okay, how long do you feel good? for a few minutes okay then something else happens to stressful what do you do you smoke again and you smoke more and you want more no so uh i think um stress has always been a reason for uh not quitting uh and actually um i think we already have some nicotine replacement available in the country in the form of gum i'm not sure maricar if we have patches already but pastilles we have so pastilles yeah. gum yung ko, eh, no? so um, there's a gum yeah. yeah so i think this can help this can help your patients deal with the withdrawal symptoms of uh, uh the, the the symptoms of nicotine withdrawal but stress everybody's stressed yeah. well, uh, maybe, Lucy, we have to let them 
uh, get involved or you know get hooked to some other worthwhile activities like you know do um, cycling or do stationary biking or do some yeah. exercising in their home in their backyards no? uh -huh. so if it's behavior modification so if we can do that in fact some would resort to cooking and eating and gain weight but then <laughs> this with 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 exercising in the confines of their home because it is possible in fact they can just turn to their facebook or you know in the social media there, there's been a lot of program in the social media on what to do physically you no know, sports wise you know singing right get get their attention uh, focus to other more productive activities Laura, that will help. That's really behavior modification. Yeah, I think just to add one last thing. I mean, I think the thing to do is if you've got a smoker on the other line, right, and you're you're doing telemedicine, you have to tell just tell them to quit. Yeah, you know, just be very decisive. You have to quit. You know, you just have to stop. <laughs> it's like you don't decrease it one yeah. cigarette a day. Just okay. stop, okay, and then give them the guidance on how to stop because. All of the studies have shown that when a doctor keeps on saying, you have to quit or you're going to die, it sticks in their head. They can't sleep at night. It comes into their subconscious. So we have to use that power, yes. that ability to influence how, because they're already thinking about it. Eh. I think that is the difference between now and pre-COVID. Before, baka hindi pa nila naiisip yan. Wala pang contemplation eh. Ngayon, ang taas ng contemplation yan eh. I've met so many people who call me and say, you know, I'm thinking of quitting. You quit now. Oh, ganun, tutulungan na kita. Paano? Ganito, ganyan, ganyan. So, let's be decisive about it because we've got a moment here. We have an opportunity to do it. I agree. I agree with that. Uh, so, I think uh, very important now is the mobile cessation uh, program that has to be reactivated by the Department of Health and also to, uh, of course, with the uh, very good support coming from the WHO, I think we can do this. Uh, Susie, you've actually initiated this kind of a program when you were still with WHO, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, we're still at it, right? You never stop. Once you're yeah, in tobacco right. control, you're always there, right? So yeah, right. every opportunity we have, I mean, I never talk about COVID without talking about tobacco. So we have to make that uh, kind of like a little bit of a conscious, make ourselves conscious of that opportunity. People are worried about their health. Right? So here's me, oh, that, um, Andy wrote here. Yes, there's Zumba through the YouTube. In fact, this yeah. is <laughs> advocate Dr. Rajema Magtiba is doing Zumba and exercising in her YouTube. Uh, yeah, her, correct. Her, so, her. yeah. Uh, 15 minutes a day. In fact, five minutes Zumba or exercise will do you good. Yeah. Um, so see, uh, regarding your question regar regarding the use, whether the Filipinos chew tobacco leaf together oh, with, with, with Betonac. Uh, yeah, tobacco. so Romel Ariola actually said that uh, there are some who, who chew uh, betel only, but there are also some who chew tobacco leaves together with the betel nut. So we, yeah. we have some um, really, really great concerns about that. Now, uh, Mr. Leomar Agravio uh, is asking this question. So this can be answered by any one of our panelists, including, of course, uh, Andy. No, um, he, His question is, uh, uh, am I still susceptible to lung disease even if he has already quit smoking? Will his lungs become healthy again after he quit smoking? So, I mean, I think you can uh, first. No, quitting, of course, I have presented on the four uh, lines. In fact, when you quit a few minutes, all right, your blood pressure, heart rate drops, and a few more hours, your carbon monoxide in the blood decreases. And then when you quit for nine to 12 weeks, uh, the risk of severe disease stops. However, however, it also depends on how much you have smoked in the past, which means the effect of the previous smoking history is already there. But the good thing here is you don't add more to the risk. You don't add more to the damages by continuously smoking so that the benefit of quitting is still there uh, physically or, you know, um, 
with symptoms, it, le it is lessened. But I cannot assure you that there will be no damage in the previous. Definitely, it might not return to normal, but definitely a lot of help in improving your symptoms and your exercise and your tolerance in your activities is there. So it is never too late to quit. While there has been effect of the severe smoking, which is um, like 20 pack years in the past, stopping smoking is still the key to a longer life, you know, to a more healthier life, much healthier life. So please quit. As what Dr. Mercado said, Susie said, if you're thinking of quitting, just quit, okay? Yeah. So there's still a lot of benefits it will do to you. All right? Okay. Yes. Um, from Kevin Bautista, uh, if smokers are more prone in getting COVID, does it apply to people who use vape as well? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think we should remind everyone you know, that when they mm -hmm. vape, they are practically uh, oh. releasing aerosols. Yes. Okay. And with aerosols, the more the, since the particles are quite smaller, so I think the more that the possibility of transmitting the disease, yes. the virus is, is higher. So, uh, I think we need to keep that uh, in mind. Okay, and then uh, uh, from uh, Kamsur, no, um, the, uh, Ms. Uh, Divina Abordo uh, saying construction workers here are shifting from cigarette to betel nut chewing. According <laughs> to them, it is much cheaper and it still get the satisfaction. <laughs> So yeah, so we are, so we end, uh, and uh, or Andy. Andy, Andy, just answer that. No? Uh, yeah. a, well, we, we know we know quite a bit about uh, Arika Nut or, or Vital Quid um, pharmacology, and you do get a high, you do get a hit with it. Mm -hmm. Having said that, it's not uh, it's not the same substance as tobacco, but it is also a known human carcinogen and is linked to oropharyngeal, uh, oronasal cancers, which are highly disfiguring and quite fatal. So it's not safe. I think that's important uh, to realize. But this is a very interesting thing to, to learn that people are now shifting to other products because of the price impact of tax increases. So yeah. maybe, maybe we need to start thinking about uh, how how we should intervene for the betel nut as well yeah. as the tobacco. Yes, right. I agree uh, with you, uh, Andy. So this is something that, uh, as I said earlier, no, we really need to, this is a growing concern and we need to find a way by which we can help earlier on no, those uh, people, our fellow men who are now shifting to betel nut. Yeah, the difficulty, the difficulty of betel nut is that because it's, it's not manufactured, they just they just get it from the tree. Yeah, that's been the, that's been the problem in the Pacific. So, but I think in terms of the interventions, uh, you know, graphic health warnings on oral cancer, because Andy said that's yeah, very disfiguring. Mm -hmm. uh, people just need to know that this is really bad for you. They probably don't think it's bad. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the time for new product, you know, using new products like this, they get a hit. So they feel good, right? It's cheap. It's free. They're just picking it up from the tree or they're buying it for three pesos or something like that. We have to push uh, on more education. Na, kasi baka hindi alam yan eh. And maybe local governments need to know that, you know, this is really bad. Apart from it being unhygienic that people are spitting. So, uh, plus, I don't know, you wear a mask and you chew the nut. I don't know how that works, right? So... Again, in the time of COVID and in the new normal, you can really find opportunities to say, no, you can't do that because you can't chew and wear your mask and you need to wash your hands. And pag mapula yung mask namin, alam mo na, hindi madum na madumi yung kamay mo and all of that stuff. No, So there's an opportunity here, I think, to teach. Okay, Marika, yeah. I think I can't let this pass. No? There's uh, something in the chat room. Uh, uh, yeah. Marivik Albano. Yeah. Let's celebrate uh, this. Yeah. Can you? Can yeah. You, no. no yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, it says here that uh, while watching, Dr. Susan mentioned this COVID pandemic 
is a good time or opportunity to educate people against the ill effects of smoking. So she texted her father and reminded him to stop. And she got her surprise when he replied, I am not smoking anymore. Yes. So to me, this is a celebration, oh. something yeah. worth mentioning. No? So this pandemic really allowed people to contemplate about life. So diba, ang ganda. I have to agree. Alam mo, I really have to agree with that, Aimee and Susie. Yeah. Susie is absolutely right. The people who smoke, alam nila na mas mataas ang risk nila. Yeah. And deep down, natatakot sila. Ako, I have an experience yan. Three weeks ago, I was in the OR. I was chatting with our anesthesiologist who's a young Asian. And he actually disclosed to me that he quit smoking. He, he apparently was a smoker. I didn't know. I didn't think doctors still smoke. But uh, he's a smoker who quit because of COVID-19 because yeah. he was afraid of catching the virus. So magandang teaching opportunity. Yes, uh, in the same manner, no. while uh, this uh, pandemic offers opportunity to stop smoking, but I think uh, there is a very little uh, knowledge uh, among our fellow men, our countrymen, about the effects, the bad effects of vaping. So vaping is another growing problem. And we have seen how strong the vaping industry is, just similar to, to tobacco industry. Uh, they have very good uh, corporate social responsibility as well. So uh, I think that this is something that... Uh, so uh, I... As Susie said, no, the tobacco industry has been promoting their products and their companies through good, through corporate social responsibility that we probably have seen also uh, as far as the vaping products are concerned. In fact, I'm quite worried about the, um, you know, publications uh, on the uh, possible helpful effects of um, vape of nicotine through uh, other alternatives, no, like vape. So um, I think that uh, this is something that um, we need to also address. And hopefully, many of our countrymen will know more about the effects of vaping. And uh, the same with uh, our legislators. No? As Amy said in her, in her lecture, no, uh, this thing about smoking tobacco products and all its alternative uh, forms, uh, this is not just um, a social movement, it is it's also a political movement and we need the help of our uh, politicians, the policy makers. Yeah, Marie Carol, just add a little something to that. No? Kasi, diba, our problem before was in vaping was, uh, you know, restaurants, bars, people, you know, and so we don't have any of those now. Yes. I think what we should push for is that when these establishments open, they should be completely free of any vaping. And all those small vaping stores, they need to be closed because you cannot do social distancing inside those vaping shops, di ba? Pag yes. Pag yung mga sa community na maliliit na ganyan, eh siksikan yun silang vape, sila nang vape into each other's faces eh. So yeah. in the name of COVID, right, we, we can say, close nyo yan, hindi yan pwede, di ba? And talk to the local governments na ito na yung pagkakataon natin na tanggalin na natin itong salot sa mga bata. Kasi mga bata yung kinukuha nila, di ba? Pinahihiram nila yung ano yung yeah. uh, e-cigaret na yon, because they can't buy their own device. I mean, really very unhygienic. So we have an opportunity to make sure na at the community level, kaya sabi ko nga yung settings, eh, di ba? Sa bahay, dapat hindi pwede. Kasi yung mga anak nyo, baka humina yung baga nila. I mean, you just really need to, ano, to, to, ano, to use the situation because they're already very aware to add on na, okay, di ba, washing hands kayo. And no vaping, no smoking. Mm -hmm. no Parang ganun, kailangan isama natin yun sa messaging natin. Kaya sabi ko, dapat yung uh, no mask, no entry, no smoking, may nakasabi din doon. Para dumami na naman yung mga no-smoking signs natin. I mean, this is an endless battle because we've got an industry that we're fighting, but we just need to do it. And it can be done. I mean, uh, if we can put up no mask, no entry uh, signs, we can just add a sticker na no-smoking. Diba? Parang paalala. Para, please, diba? Paalala. 
Yeah, I saw here kanina, um, Susie, no? may anong comment. He's just a teacher and she's talking about uh, informing or education, educating the students. No? Good opportunity. Kasi remember, risk factor yung young age and then old age, right? So nandun sila sa spectrum yes. ng below 21 years old, especially the high school students. Yes, we're willing to share these slides. In fact, when this is, after this, we can set like, Zoom or whatever, no, kung, kung no face to face pa rin in the school, we can schedule this, Marika, with our, with PCP. Yeah. And, you know, no, uh, this will be, uh, this uh, webinar is actually being live streamed on Facebook, and this will be, um, play, this will be available on our, on Facebook for one, one month. So if they want to, um, to, go back to go to our site and then and play the, the the recording of this uh, webinar they can do so but uh, i think uh, they're also asking for your powerpoint presentation I'm, I'm okay with it i can share this you know. uh, no problem yeah. marika andy had a comment there about tuberculosis no yes. and i've been talking about this lately in the media because let's uh, no, no, we're going into the new normal and diba, we want the new normal to be a better normal. And sabi ko nga, if we publish every day how many people die of tuberculosis, wala nang lalabas sa bahay. And we have to emphasize it's airborne. Right? You look at 70 deaths a day. 70 deaths a day. And it has never bothered us. It's never bothered us. You know, we don't hit 70 deaths a day in COVID. But because you see the numbers every day, ito na yung sinasabi natin, yung advocacy, yung awareness level, ang taas sa COVID, kaya takot yung tao. So ngayon, habang nag-educate -e tayo, pag-usapan na rin natin yung tuberculosis kasi ang dami niyan. 30,000 new cases a year yan. Ang dami-dami niyan na ano, merong uh, na drug resistant. no? So, uh, you know, I think uh, as we go into a more, I don't want to say more normal, eh, no? a different, better normal, all of the public health problems that we've seen have to come together. Because they do come together. They really do come together. So I'm glad Andy just reminded us about tuberculosis because that's airborne. Yeah. Parang, no, mo, Susie, if I may share, in the hospital, uh -oh. in the pandemic, bumaba ang admission sa ibang general ward, but our CD or communicable disease ward has always been full. And these are patients na with complicated TB already. Yeah. It's never been empty. The other wards, yes. The general NCD wards, yes. But uh, even the critical care unit are quite not occupied during this um, pandemic period. But the communicable disease ward, may surplus pa kami sa ER with TB, complicated TB. Mm -hmm. So tama si Andy. It doesn't change and you are correct. It's still there. It's not going down. But let's take this opportunity to yeah. you know, restrict them. And, and do one no? uh, prevention control for TB. So, agree ako dyan. May isang comment dito. Maricar, oh, yes. brief tobacco intervention session for healthcare workers online. Or maybe it's about time. No? Remember what Andy shared with us, yung video, or the visual presentation of uh, demonstrating how to do VTI. And so, let's do this again and, and and make it again uh, active, no? our activities on this. Uh, I think, um, uh, yun nga, as I was actually saying earlier, it's time for us to reactivate the, um, the mobile cessation program. And that I think we can, we can really do now because uh, especially now that uh, we have been using all these, um, these, um, virtual platforms no and the mobile cessation is basically making use of virtual platforms so this is something really that we can uh, go into and probably be part of the new normal so we don't even have to be facing each other when we do our smoking cessation now um i'd like also to mention some of the things that are being uh posted in the chat in the chat book in the in the webinar chat uh, in Iriga they said that they penalize uh, spitting in public place prohibiting chewing and spitting better not better not so uh, um, so congratulations for that in um, 
uh, in Laguna, they, uh, Sherwin said that they have a new provincial ordinance uh, that includes not just tobacco but ends as well. So good for uh, the Laguna residents. Ayan, tama. And Andy, yes, uh, BTI online training. <laughs> Uh, in fact, that is something that uh, probably we can now go into. Uh, Andy, maybe you can uh, uh, that. you can help us with that, no? Ayan, nag-commit na si Mike sa DOH. We'll support Yay! Yes, yeah. Right. Okay, good. So, anything else? Yeah, Andy, thank you, uh, always. So we've had a very good discussion, you know? So it's now 4.43. So I guess um, we now have learned a lot about uh, smoking and uh, COVID-19 and that no smoking is really now the, the uh, new normal, right? And so with that, uh, I'd like to call on first uh, before we wrap up everything. I'd like to call uh, Mr. Bobby Del Rosario, President of Action on Smoking and Health Philippines for the closing remarks. Thank you, Maricar. Uh, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Hi, Bob. Yeah, hello. Bob. <laughs> anyway, first of all, I want to extend our deepest ano, gratitude to Dr. Susan Mercado, to Dr. Amanda Mateo, the panelists, uh, for sharing their expertise and their wisdom on a subject that has been uh, plaguing the world actually for decades. And I would also, also uh, like to thank uh, all of you, the attendees in this webinar, for taking time and listening to our experts and panelists. I mean, dedicating your time alone means that uh, you are genuinely our health advocates, health warriors. Baga, mabuhay po kayong lahat, fellow health warriors. Um, uh, the pandemic caused by COVID-19 actually changed the whole world. No? And it forced us to change, maybe out of need or uh, maybe out of fear. Whatever the reasons are, we're changing because we have to survive the fear of dying. So that is, I think, the very character of human existence, to preserve one's life. However, due to lack, probably uh, lack of knowledge and maybe because of uh, greed of other people, nawawala itong tinatawag natin na self-preservation. Uh, Actually, some nights na papaisip ako eh. Uh, itong COVID-19 sa atin, may what, 1,100 na tao na ang namamatay. No? Masa mahigit na, let's say, tatlong buwan. Dahil naman po sa Sagirillo, may 21,600 na ang namamatay in the same number of months versus the deaths due to COVID-19. Eh, inisip ko bakit parang Ang laki lang nagpapanik lahat sa COVID-19. Of course, it's because of the, you know, yung nakakahawang version, mabilis siyang kumalat. Pero mas malaki yung deaths na nangyayari every year and yet walang much attention given to 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 the plagues being uh, being attributed to cigarettes versus attention na bigyan sa COVID-19. Baka siguro dapat bigyan ng, you know, mas, uh, mas, mas, uh, passion uh, by, by uh, you know, uh, people in power or people with influence. So I believe that as a health advocates, actually it is our passion and our duty to inform the public about the harmful and deadly effects of cigarettes in any form, whether it's uh, e-cigarettes or heated tobacco or uh, chewable tobacco or any, any uh, nicotine product that is resistant. But more importantly, to fight, to persuade, to put conscience in the institutions into the minds of the people behind these institutions and the people in power supporting the tobacco industry. The message that life is more important, more precious than money. And maybe as mentioned, this is the right time for all of us to go into full gear in protecting the lives of the Filipinos. So uh, my dear fellow health warriors in behalf of the Philippine College of Physicians, Ash Philippines and the Department of Health, let us all be one in saving lives. Make no smoking as the new normal. Maraming salamat po. Stay safe and God bless us all. Yes, uh, thank you again, everyone. Um, this is uh, Marie.
Ati Carlin Pin saying goodbye to to all of you and thank you for joining the webinar. Um, just like um, before we end, no, I'd like to invite everyone to please go to the website of Ash Philippines. Uh, you will find there our newly uh, developed uh, audiovisual presentation on. Um, on no smoking no so you can make use of this you can download it in your in your, you can actually download it and use it in your uh in your respective localities or in your work in any of your advocacy so thank you again everyone uh see you again uh the next webinar the our next webinar will probably be tackling on uh, vape, vaping thank you Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mario.